That sounded like a video game starting up or something. All right. So thank you guys so much for coming. This is our third night of our volunteer formation nights. Um, if you are joining us via live stream, welcome as well. And if this is your first day, we're so glad to see you. If you want to catch up on any of the classes that we've had so far, you can do so via our Facebook page for St. Hillary or St. Anthony. Um, we have the live streams up still on the, on, the, on the news feed. And if you are familiar with our podcast, the Boost podcast, um, that has been resurrected after the storm and we're, um, we're putting all of our classes on our podcast as well. Um, so again, thank you so much for coming. This is something that we really, I, I know I haven't spoken yet. Um, I'm, I'm Jen, by the way. I am the Director of Outreach and Worship here at St. Hillary and St. Anthony. Um, I am a, a consecrated virgin for the Diocese of Home Thibodeau since the year 2019. I am a, have a master's in theology from Notre Dame Seminary. I got to hang out with these uh, lovely humans for a few years and study alongside them. Um, so today, what I'm going to be talking to you all about is prayer and how we do that and what that looks like. Uh, as Catholics, we are very, very familiar with prayer. Uh, we do it a lot. <laughs> but it can help to know some of the basics about how we pray. Uh, not necessarily types of prayer, but how we pray any type of prayer. So how we can enter more deeply every time we come to the, to the Lord in prayer, how we can enter more deeply. Um, so on that note, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we thank you for the gift of this day. We praise you for the gift of our lives. And Lord, our Father, we ask that you would open our hearts today. Open our hearts to the beauty of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, be with us, walk with us. Teach us how to pray, as you taught your, your disciples how to pray. And Holy Spirit, come into our hearts, inflame our hearts with love for you, with a desire for you alone. Mother Mary, pray with us and for us. We ask all of this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. So, it's important to think about, before we dive directly into what is prayer, uh, it's important to think about the classes that we've done so far, right? All of our Catholic faith is integrated together. There's nothing that stands apart. We are a both-and people. Um, and so our first class was about the human person, about who we are, how we're made, why we're made, what we're made for. And that's important to know when we're talking about prayer because it helps us to understand how we can enter into prayer, what, what it looks like to fully enter in as a human being, and also what the goal of prayer is. Um, so it's important that we keep all of that in mind that we learned from Father JD a couple weeks ago. Um, it's important to know about who God the Father is and who he isn't, and who God the Son, Jesus Christ, is and who he is not. Because when we enter into prayer, we are entering into, spoiler alert, relationship. That's going to be a word that you're going to hear me say a lot tonight. We're entering into relationship. So, before we even get to what is prayer, let's talk about what the desire for God is. The desire for God is something that's in each of our hearts. Okay? We as human beings, um, and this isn't in your notes, if you want to jot this down, it's, it's a really helpful thing to know. What are the five faculties of the human soul? So Thomas Aquinas teaches us about something called the five faculties of the human soul or the human person. What are those faculties? They're the intellect, the will, memory, imagination, and the emotions. So our intellect, our will, our memory, our imagination, and our emotions. 
Now, when I say faculties, I mean these are the things that we use. These are the things that make us human in particular, that mean we have a rational soul. You know, something more than your wonderful dog who loves you so much and just like, you just wants to play fetch all day long. He doesn't have a rational soul. He has an animal soul, which is awesome and exactly how he's designed and how he's made. Um, but he doesn't think about why he's here. He's just really excited to see you. But we, with our intellect and our will and our memory and our imagination and even our emotions, we have the ability for relationship with God. And we do this by entering into prayer. So with those faculties and with who we are as human persons, I think Father J.D. talked a little bit about this. There's something deep in our hearts that longs for the good. Okay? When you think about anything that you want, anything that you desire, it could be for me to stop talking so you can go home and eat dinner. It might be to get a great night's sleep tonight. It might be for your mama's famous gumbo. The things that you want, you see as good. Spoiler alert, that's why we sin. Because we think our sins are good. There's something in us that's disordered that thinks this sin is a good thing and that's why I want it. Right? So we naturally, through those faculties, through who we are as human beings, with our rational souls, we, we search for the good. That's how we're designed. And the good, of course, we know this as Catholics, the ultimate good is God himself. And so we naturally know of God's existence in how we were created, and we also naturally desire God because he is the greatest good. Um, the Catechism tells us that the dignity of man rests above all in the fact that he's called to communion with God. This invitation to converse with God is addressed to man as soon as he comes into being. So from the moment of conception, from the moment that we are brought into the world, we have a desire for that communion. And we, in this seeking, we, we see this throughout history, humans seeking God, right? We've seen it in all of our history classes where we talked about, you know, the, the pagans of the old world, um, pagans of today, we're all seeking something greater than ourselves. The really beautiful thing, the really cool thing about Christianity is that we're not just seeking God. God is seeking us first. God has sought us from the beginning. And that is unique to Christianity. Because you probably know, like, when, when we talk about things like the pagans, when, we, when you hear about that in the biblical stories, like the story of, um, I think it was Elijah and the, the prophets of Baal, and the prophets of Baal are just, like, ripping themselves to shreds because no one's answering their call. And, but God, but Elijah calls upon God, the one true God, and his sacrifice is accepted because God is seeking us. There are no other religions wherein God is seeking his people. Okay. So, the most basic definition of prayer is connection with God. We learn that again in the Catechism. You see a lot of really beautiful quotes from the Catechism in your notes today because the Catechism is just such a beautiful um, resource that we have in the church that we've had for a few years. I uh, highly encourage everyone to own one. It's fantastic. Um, the Catechism 2565 tells us the most basic definition of prayer is communication with God, the exercising of a relationship with God. And I want you, before we go any farther, to take a second and think about the best human relationship in your life. Think about your best friend. Maybe that's your spouse, maybe that's your boyfriend or girlfriend, maybe that's the person you grew up with, you, you were in diapers together in the paddling pool. Whoever that is, I want you to picture that person as we continue talking about prayer. Because how we communicate with each other is an echo of how we're called to communicate with God. Right? So, prayer is a raising of our minds and our hearts to God. Um, it's something where 
we are letting go of our own control of the situation and in humility coming to the Lord and offering ourselves to him. Um, The Catechism, again, tells us that humility is the foundation of prayer. And only when we humbly acknowledge that we do not know how to pray as we ought, are we really, are we ready to receive freely the gift of prayer. Man is a beggar before God. And man in search of God, being called first by God. Our, our prayer is our response. Sometimes it doesn't feel like, sometimes it feels like I came in and started praying and I sat down, because we're, we're linear thinkers, right? We, we have chron- chronological order. We love that. Um, and so it's like, I came in and I sat down and I started the conversation. But rather, the conversation has been the fullness of your life. The prayer has been everything that's happened to you since that moment you were, you were created. Our prayer response, prayer is not something that we, uh, which for me was a revelation that made me spiral completely when I learned that prayer is everything I do. I was like, what are you talking about? I'm sitting here doing the work. What am I supposed to be doing? Um, but it's something in which we enter. And it's something very mysterious, because it is this thing that is beyond our complete understanding. Um, If you're familiar with types of prayer, like the Rosary or the Divine Mercy Chaplet, it can sometimes feel like that's something very structured and very, like, open and close kind of case. Like, I know exactly what I'm doing, I am praying these exact words, and then we're going to go. Um... But the beauty of it is that we know this really well. That is not our is the love of our lives and beyond our lives. So when we enter into prayer, we're entering into that relationship. And it's not something that we've initiated. God has initiated it first. Um, so that's the first really important thing to remember is that prayer is not something that we do. And actually, that can be a great comfort to us. We're going to talk in a, in a couple of minutes here about um, what if I don't hear God talking to me? What if I don't know how to pray well? Um, that's the beauty of it, is that you don't have to pray well. You just have to open your heart to the action of God that's already happening. Um, so there's a really beautiful book by um, Sister Ruth Burroughs. She is um, a Carmelite, Order of um, Discalced Carmelites, called Essence of Prayer. And this, bo- this quote at the bottom of your first page is, uh, from, is from that book, and it's just a really beautiful um, meditate on when you have that fear of coming to prayer and thinking, I don't know how to pray. So she says, our Christian knowledge assures us that prayer is essentially what God does, how God addresses us, looks at us. It is not primarily something we are doing to God, something we are giving to God, but what God is doing for us. And what God is doing for us is giving us the divine self in love. So the beauty of prayer lies in the fact that we are entering into the movement of the Trinity. Again, we talked a little bit about God the Father and God the Son. God the Father pours himself out completely to the Son. The Son pours himself out completely to the Father, and from that spires forth the Holy Spirit. When we pray, we are entering that action of the Trinity. We're right in the thick of it, right in the middle. God pouring out his divine love upon us when we go to prayer. Um, And that's a beautiful thing to think on, and and a beautiful thing that affects our imagination, it affects our our emotions. Um, But one, a second important thing to remember about prayer is that it's not about the experience, okay? If you are someone who really is, like, into the charismatic movement, beautiful movement that brought a lot of Catholics back into the church, um, beautiful, like, musically-led, spirit-led type of prayer that is 
exceptional and is a beautiful starting point. Um, but again, like any other relationship, there's that butterfly stage, right? It's like, oh, I hope they look over at me, or I hope they like the same books that I do. That was my first thought, because I'm a nerd. Um, but it's those first moments of that relationship, of, of meeting your best friend and thinking, you're, you're going to be with me forever. <laughs> um, but what happens when that's the only part of that human relationship? What happens when we leave it there? It falls flat, right? When the excitement is done, I still don't know you. I haven't built on that foundation. So when we rely in prayer on our experience of prayer, on the, the fluttering of our heart, or those what we call consolations in prayer, we can deepen the relationship that we could have with the Lord to something that's very sense-oriented. And again, using the, the, the relationship with your best friend as an example, because we're, we're human beings, we interact with other people, and God made us to take in through our senses what we can also take in spiritually. So that's why I'm using the, the best friend example, because when I can love my best friend well, that teaches me how to love God better. So prayer isn't necessarily just about the experience. The experience is beautiful. Don't get me wrong. Love a beautiful adoration experience. Love praying in community. It's a wonderful experience. But again, if that's as far as your friendship goes with your best friend, there's something missing. There's a need to enter in with our minds, with our intellect, with our memory, with our will. Um... So again, Ruth Burroughs says really beautifully, I'm just going to pull out that uh, bolded section of, um, of what she says here. When we cast aside our egotism, allowing God's love to purify it more and more, whatever the cost, or will we camouflage it, give it other more spiritual names, and look around for so-called spiritual guides who will offer us ego-satisfying techniques with the promise of an experience? This experiential prayer that she's talking about is what we can also call effective prayer, not effective, affective. So it's like affecting me. Um, these affective movements we call like thoughts and feelings and desires are a means by which God communicates his love. But they're not the end, right? Again, just as any rela earthly relationship doesn't end with the butterfly stage, or we hope that it doesn't, our relationship with God can't end with me walking out the door and being like, wow, that was cool. All right, who am I going to tailgate all the way back home to Thibodeau? Right? Nothing has changed. I've not allowed it to go deeper than surface level. So what I'm called to do is I'm called to allow all of my faculties to enter in. I'm meant to use my intellect. I'm meant to use my will. We're going to talk about how, to, how those enter in. I'm meant to use my memory. So just like I was talking about consolations a second ago, those consolations and prayers, those, those wonderful evenings where you come to Mercy Night and it's just fireworks all over the place. We also have moments that we call desolation. This is when we don't feel those things in prayer. And desolation can sometimes be more prevalent than consolation. It can be very hard to pray daily through desolation. But when we use our memory, when we use that in prayer, that faculty, we can remember, oh, no, 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 that happened. That was a reality that I felt that was from God. And I have to carry that into this moment as well. Same thing if you have an argument with your best friend. Oh, they drive me crazy. I don't want to talk to them anymore. How do I forgive them? remember all of the times before that they've forgiven me, that I've messed up, that they've treated me with the kindness and love and respect that, that I'm used to. So I can go back to that relationship and say, no, this is worth keeping, this is worth fixing, right? So effective prayer, effective movements are a means, but the desire for experience has to be something that we let go of. Desiring experience in prayer is, is 
focused on us. Okay? And when we talked last week about God the Father and God the Son, we talked a little bit about what we're called to do. And we talked about it the first week, too. What are we called to do? We're called to know, love, and serve God in this life, so as to be with him forever in the next. Remember, what am I looking for? What am I made to do? Made to seek the good. Prayer is that avenue by which I seek the good, by which I come closer to the good. That is God himself. Okay? So when I can come out of myself, when I cannot navel gaze, ooh, that just got louder. Um, yes, that's how microphones work. You get, cl- you get closer. Let's start going. Um, but when I can stop navel gazing in prayer, when I can lift my eyes to the Lord, I can join in that, join in that relationship, join in that action that's already happening more fully. Okay. So coming out of ourselves, how do we more deeply enter into prayer as relationship? How do we make that sacrifice of self, of that egocentrism, to look more towards God? Okay. And the first thing we want to do is look at the scriptures. Scriptures are beautiful. If you've, if you've uh, looked ahead, you can see that we have a couple of them that we're going to look at. That's your homework for the week. I used to be a school teacher, so I'm mean, so I give lots of homework. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but no, it's just because we love scripture, we're Catholic, we, we want to dive in. Um, but the first scripture I want to look at is Luke 11. So in chapter 11 of, of Luke's gospel, Jesus is, pr- is praying. So the context is like, Jesus is praying, the apostles see him and they're like, wow, I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> He was praying in a certain place, and when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. And we know the rest, right? We're very familiar with the Our Father. We love the Our Father. It's a fantastic prayer. But the beauty of what we know and what we learn from this particular scripture passage is first of all, just the very relieving fact that the apostles didn't know how to pray either. So, fantastic. <laughs> I'm not alone. The disciples and the apostles wanted to learn how to pray. So they asked, Jesus, how do I pray? And just sidebar, that's a beautiful way to come to prayer, is to just come, sit in front of the Lord, and say, Lord, I don't know how to pray as I ought. Help me. That's that humility, right, that we were talking about earlier. That's me opening my heart to the movement that God's already in and allowing him to change from the inside out. Um, so if it ever is, a, pro- if it ever is a, a stumbling block, if Satan ever tries to put it in your way that you don't know how to pray, you can be like, great, it's in scripture. They didn't either. We're working on it. So the disciples wanted to learn how to pray. And the first thing that Jesus says this is how you pray. Father, our Father who art in heaven. That's intimate. We know how intimate it is, right? You've probably heard a homily at some point about the intimacy of calling God Father. No one has done that thus far. The Jews would not even say the name of God, right? And here's Jesus telling them to call him his, their Father. When we enter into prayer, we're entering into that intimacy first, that relationship first. And then the second thing, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The very next thing I do is I enter in and I focus on him. Hallowed be thy name. Not, here's my list of things I want you to fix. Not, here's all of my woes and I'm just going to keep talking until I leave this place in 23 minutes. Right? And I'm not saying that we don't bring those things. But the first movement of our heart, that first movement, when I walk in the door and I see my spouse, what is the first movement of my heart? Is it, let me tell you about the day I just had? Maybe some days it is. (laughs) But what's the first movement of your heart? It's, oh, this is the person. This is the person that I love. This is who I want to come home to, right? 
So we are opening ourselves first to the intimacy of calling God our Father, and second, we're focusing on Him in prayer so that we can enter into that action that's already happening, that divine movement of Father to Son, Son to Father, and Holy Spirit in the mix. Okay. So, what if I don't feel like I hear God in prayer? Okay. Um, depending on what your favorite type of prayer is, there are many, many types of prayer in the Catholic Church, right? We've got, we've got Mass, the most important prayer that um, Ryan's going to talk about next week. Just lob it over to you. Um, but the most important prayer, the prayer that we enter into, the prayer of Jesus Christ, the, the High Priest, to the Father, through the Holy Spirit. We have the Liturgy of the Hours. We have rosaries, adoration, divine mercy chaplet, um, charismatic prayer, praise and worship. We have so many different ways in which we can pray. Um, but what if I don't feel like I hear God? The first step in any type of prayer, in entering more deeply into any type of prayer, is giving God the time necessary. Okay? So, what does that mean? That means, again, a self-sacrifice of my time. So it's not just when I think of it, and I'm running out the door with my coffee spilling all over me, and I forgot to tie the kid's shoes, and he's wearing them on the wrong feet anyway, and, oh, God, help me. That should not be our only moment of prayer. God bless you. That should be, that should be a part of our lives. It should be so ingrained in us that we, we're, we're turning to God. But we have to first set aside particular moments for God. Um, if you've ever spoken to a, a priest or a religious or me about our prayer lives, we, particularly because I'm a bride of Christ, um, so that's my husband, so I gotta talk to him. Um, but we talk about how we set aside times of prayer. Right? And maybe as the lay faithful, maybe y'all have those times of prayer set aside, and that's fantastic. What we want to do is we want to do that with purpose. We want to make sure that we're doing that on purpose. Um, so where can I, every day, find time that is directly for the Lord? Right? Um, and that's difficult, especially if you have young children especially if you have a lot of children, especially if you have a very demanding job, doctors, nurses, people who are pulled from their homes for long periods of time or who have little ones who demand their time all day, right? It is a sacrifice for, for all of us to make in order for that relationship to prosper. Because again, if I'm just running past my husband or my wife when I come home, if I'm just like, sorry, gotta go, bye, that relationship is, is going to suffer, right? It's never going to be completely whole. Um, and the beauty of making time, the beauty of, of actually making that sacrifice and making time is that God delights in it. Um, there's a really long quote right here, and I put it in because my best friend rocks. Um, and I was um, struggling for a while with my holy hour. Um, I was coming into the chapel, and I was twiddling my thumbs, scrolling through my phone, kind of sitting around not really sure what to do. Um, and so I texted them. I said, I, I am not praying well. I'm not praying well. And this was the response. My best friend's uh, love language. Y'all familiar with the love languages? It's like how you, how you feel well-loved. It's like acts of service, quality time, gift-giving. Um, those are the only three that are coming into my head. Words of affirmation um, and physical affection. So those are kind of like the five main ways in which people feel or give love very well. Um, so my best friend's love language is quality time. Mine is not. I hate sitting around and doing nothing. <laughs> Because my, my love language is, um, is acts of service. So 
if I'm not doing something to show you that I love you, I am dying inside. <laughs> or I feel like you think I don't love you, right? So I was telling my best friend about, I'm sitting in there in the, in the chapel, can't pray my holy hour, just totally in a daze, don't know what to do. And this was their response. I remember times when you've asked me, what do you want to do? And I responded with something like, I just want to rest. Because it's way better to just hang out in your presence, even if you're cooking or sitting in a chair and reading, laying on your phone, because I'm in the presence of a dear friend who cares for me. And then just continue to say some really beautiful things. I'm surely not God, but I think I learned that from him. Yes, he wants to talk with you sometimes and to enter into more intimate moments sometimes. But I think he's also happy if you go in and do your spiritual reading the whole time. You're there, and he's there, and that's good. So this is why we can't just rely on experience in prayer to build that relationship, right? Because if everything I worried about was the experience, how am I going to feel? How's it going to affect my heart? Am I going to want to sing? Am I going to want to do this? We miss out on some of the most intimate moments where it's just me engaging my will, saying, I'm going to be here for the next 45 minutes. Even if I am distracted the whole time, I am choosing you. I'm using my will. I'm using my intellect to know, you know, he's talking about my spiritual reading, right? So if I bring something spiritual to read, if I'm, if I'm, making my mind more rich with what the Lord has to, has to give to me. If that's in the scriptures or if that's in the writings of the saints, whatever that might be. I'm making the sacrifice to be there with him, and he delights in that. Okay? So that's the first thing that we want to do, for, especially if we're struggling in prayer right now, is to make ourselves available, purposefully available, for more than eight seconds for the Lord. Okay. The second thing that we can do is we can turn to the scriptures. Okay. So maybe you're new to the spiritual life. Maybe it's something that's just started unfolding in your life. Maybe you don't have a spiritual director, um, someone who can tell you, like, hey, you should read this next. Um, but the beauty is that we have these scriptures. Um, this is... I wish we could just keep talking about scripture the whole time, because this is the word of God, really and truly. And I forget that a lot, and I'm saying that, and you guys are probably like, okay, she's crazy. But it's so important to not forget that, because if you're not hearing God in your mind, he's speaking right here. These are his words. They're not perfect because we're not perfect, there's a lot of bloodshed. There's a lot of stupidity because we're, yeah, we, we mess up a lot. But this is the word of God. This is where he can speak to you if you're struggling. So, and I say that with such emphasis because I am, I have the memory span of a goldfish. I forget that constantly. That this is sitting in my car waiting for me for my holy hour. For the word of God to come into my heart and just speak to whatever is in my heart. Okay. So we turn to the scriptures because the scriptures are an excellent way to put that dialogue into practice. It's his word addressed to us that we listen to and then respond to by internalizing it and making resolution. Okay. What do I mean by that? So to internalize and make resolutions about the scriptures— means that we need to do more than simply read it, shut the Bible, and go on our way. Um, and one of the types of prayer where we can do that is called Lexio Divina. Okay? So Lexio Divina is the, is the Latin term. It just means divine reading. But it's a process by which we enter more deeply into the scriptures. Okay? So we're going to practice it real quick, um, and you can kind of see you've got a little bit of homework, and I'll go over that in a second. Um, but Lexio Divina allows us to enter more deeply into prayer by a, a 
particular process of diving into the scriptures, okay? Um, and what, and, and I'm going to jump into it in a second, but I wanted to say before we do that, um, this type of prayer, this, this diving into adoration, this diving into um, the scriptures, helps us also to live the liturgical life, um, which we're going to talk about next week, but also um, comes from the liturgical life. Okay, so all of our prayer kind of feeds into each other. Um, but I, I wanted particularly to bring up the liturgical life, because we're going to talk about it um, the next time we meet. Um, but when we started talking, and I started talking about the Mass, I'm pointing behind me because the altar is behind me. Um, when we started talking about Mass, and we started talking about how that's the most important type of prayer that we do, it's also one of the most complex. Um, so the liturgical life is beautiful. Um, it's the most important prayer that we could ever enter into. Um, and Lexio Divina can help us to do that, because what is the, the liturgy mostly made up of, other than the most important part, the, the pinnacle, the, the, um, the confection of the Eucharist, it's the liturgy of the Word, right? We're hearing the Word of God, and then we're meeting God in body, blood, soul, and divinity that is the Eucharist, right? So, basically what I'm trying to get at here is that um, all of the prayer that we do, all of the ways in which we pray, are meant to bring us back to the liturgy, but also flow forth from the liturgy. So, but I'll leave the rest for, for Ryan for next week. Um, so, how do we do Lexio Divina? Um, if you are familiar with it already, bear with me. Um, the best way to dive into Lexio Divina to start, um, well, you've got your challenge for the week. I'm actually going to look at that right now. So, you've got a 14 days of a challenge to do Lexio Divina once a day before we meet again. Because we're not meeting again next week, just FYI. <laughs> we're, uh, we're giving y'all a week break. Um, and then we're coming back on the 20, 22nd. I can do math. Yeah, no, I can't. Um, but yeah, so June 22nd is the next time that we're going to meet. So you've got 14 days here, um, and you can skip around. It's, it's your playground of wh where you want to start, where you want to end, um, how many you do. Because maybe one of them speaks to you so intently on one day that you want to go back the next day. There are times when I've been on retreat and I'm like, all right, I've got all of my scriptures ready to go and I never get past the first one <laughs> because the Lord wants to speak so deeply into that one scripture. Um, so Lexio Divina, how do we start? The best way to start when you don't have a list like this is to go to the daily readings okay, or the Sunday readings um, because those are beautifully parsed out for you. You know, little sections. You don't have to know when to start or stop can dive into to whatever it already has listed for you, and you know that you're going to be reading a good chunk or a story from Scripture, okay? and it's going to make sense. It's not going to be like starting and stopping in weird spots. So go to the daily readings. Go to the Sunday readings. Use those. And we enter into Lectio Divina by first reading, okay? So when we do Lectio Divina, we want to read this, well, we want to first enter into prayer, so we, you know, we do the sign of the cross, we ask the Lord to come to be with us, settle our hearts. Um, Father Mark Toops likes to say, um, settle your heart for the span of our Father, and start. Okay? So taking that time to, again, pull ourselves up from navel-gazing, come and be with the Lord, and then open our scriptures. Okay? And it doesn't have to be long. The one we're going to look at today is six lines, six verses. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't have to be the longest thing in the world. And what you're going to do is you're going to read it slowly. Okay? You're going to take in what you can, read it slowly one time, and then pick out what sticks out to you. Maybe it's a word. Maybe it's a phrase. Maybe it's just a sense that you get 
from, from the reading, from what's going on in that reading. Take that for a second. Kind of keep it in, in that part of your heart, you know, like Mary does. Keep it, ponder it in your heart. And then read it a second time. And see what else the Lord pulls out, or if it's the same thing again. And then after that second reading, we want to start to ask questions about what stood out. So why, you know, we're going to read today about Bartimaeus, the blind man who comes to Jesus and says, I want to see. Maybe Bartimaeus is sticking out to you. What about Bartimaeus? Maybe it's his blindness. And we start talking to the Lord about, why is that sticking out to me? Maybe the Lord prompts your memory, because you felt really lost and alone this week. You felt really blinded by someone who really hurt you. Um, Okay, Lord, what do you want me to do with that? Where do you want me to take that? Instead of just kind of closing in and thinking, all right, like, I just can't do this. I'm just, I'm always going to be blind. No, like, let the Lord enter into that moment. He's pulling you towards something so that he can be with you in it. Right? And again, this is harder when we're in desolation. It's a harder thing to feel like the Lord is speaking to us. But again, when we engage our intellect, when we engage our will and say, no, this is the word of God. God is speaking through these pages. It can change our perspective on whether or not we're not hearing God. Okay? So we take those things that the Lord has pointed out to us or that have stuck out to us really strongly. And we ask the Lord how he's asking us to grow in holiness. Because again, what is the point of our lives is to know, love, and serve the Lord in this life so as to be with him forever in the next because we desire the good. We desire God himself. Okay? So my desire for God, because I want to be with God forever, right, in heaven, means I need to be a saint so that I can get into heaven. Or I need to do my best on this side of heaven to be as holy and in love with him as humanly possible. Okay? So what, what are you pointing out to me here that's calling me to deeper virtue? Right? Or what are you calling me to where you're trying to heal me? Right? Because you can't, we, we, there's some roadblocks that the Lord needs to move for us in order for us to become saints. Now, there's some roadblocks that we've got to live with forever, like St. Paul says, the thorn in his side that was never removed. Sometimes we're like, okay, you're doing all the work, because he is, right? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Um, he is doing all of the hard work. But when we enter into it with him, we enter into that relationship. That's the beauty of prayer. Um, so... I'm going to pretend like I'm doing Lexio Divina. Um, well, I'm not going to pretend like I'm, I'm going to do Lexio Divina out loud with y'all, with um, Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Um, so that when you leave tonight, so we talked a lot about like kind of the heady stuff about prayer, like what, you know, what I'm supposed to be focusing on, what faculties I'm using. Mostly because I could have just told you guys about a bunch of different kinds of prayer. But if it's not helping you to enter that relationship, if you're not leaving those um, maybe like spoken prayers different, then it's not, it's not worth just adding more prayers to your plate, right? Because again, God's not a slot machine. We're entering into relationship. Okay? So... Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. We take a moment, we settle our hearts. Turn our gaze to the Trinity. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. 
And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. He cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, rise, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Master, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. Immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. So I see this story about Bartimaeus and Jesus. Maybe using my imagination to place myself in the context of the story. And the words that are sticking out to me, what's sticking out? Take heart, rise, he is calling you. That line in particular was sticking out to me when I read it. Take heart, rise, he is calling you. Sit with that for a second. What's in my heart? that's responding to. And I take it and I read it a second time. They came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, rise, he is calling you. Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Master, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. This is the point at which usually I'll, I'll say some sort of prayer of gratitude for the scripture that I'm reading, knowing that there's the action of the bridegroom, the action of Jesus Christ, that historically has happened, that spiritually is happening to me. That line is still sticking out, take heart, rise, he is calling you. That's still sticking out to me. So now I enter into that dialogue, ex- the external dialogue with the Lord. Okay. Why, why is that sticking out to me, Lord? What are you asking of me? What are you asking of in my heart? That that's calling to me. And when I think back and I use my memory and I think about, well, what was my week like? What have the past few days been like? Past month been like? Rise, he is calling you. Well, there have been some situations where I've taken the easy road. You know, I've maybe gone to prayer and I've done the liturgy of the hours. And I've just been like, okay, bye, gotta go. But he's calling me. So I have to look into that, and I have to see why that's happening. What's going on in my heart? Am I pulling back because I'm worried about what the Lord's asking of me? Do 
what it feels like, probably. So what, I'm, what are you calling me to do? You're calling me to rise and back to you. Because the call of prayer, the call of the Lord, is constant. His desire for us is insatiable. Jesus' response to Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? That's the question that we can hear God asking us in prayer all the time. Because again, God's desire for us is insatiable. No matter what you think you feel, the proof is in what he's done for us. Let your prayer come from that understanding. That this God waits for you here. That's one of the really beautiful things about the Eucharist. Is that God has been waiting 2,000 years for you to be sitting here right now. Since that moment on the cross, where the blood and water poured forth from his side, he has been waiting this moment every single one of you. I don't know if you've ever heard the quote from St. Augustine, I think it's from St. Augustine, that God loves each of us as if there were only one of us to love. And so when we enter into prayer, it's not just us talking to everybody else's God. It's not me talking to, you know, your God. It's not me talking to my friends version of God. This is God himself desiring me. Little old me. And loving me as if there's only one of me. Dying for me as if there was only one of me to die for. That's how he looks at each one of us. That's how he looks at each one of you. What do you want me to do for you? How do you want to know my love? So That's what our challenge is for the next two weeks, is to do our best to enter into that movement of the Spirit, that movement of Jesus Christ, um, through Lexio Divina. And you can kind of see, you've got a mixture in there of stories, psalms, and just a couple of in, I wrote this, so I got to pick my favorites. You got my favorites. But we have the story of the nativity, um, the story of Jesus Christ, I am the vine, you are the branches, the story of Jairus' daughter and Veronica, the hemorrhaging woman, the preparation across the Red Sea, the crucifixion, the bride of the Lamb, a whole bunch of different things to pray on and, and prepare your heart with. Um, and this may have felt like a little bit more of a survey class, maybe, than the other ones have, have been like. But it's, part of it is because of the fact that prayer is very personal. Um, we know the, the general ideas of how to pray. But you, personally, also know the best way for you to speak to the Lord. And maybe that's through a scriptural rosary. Maybe that's through, you have your, your prayer space. You go and you sit there for 20 minutes with your coffee and your Bible, and that's where you speak with the Lord. Um, and that's just kind of a beautiful reminder of the fact that we are all the body of Christ in different ways. Um, but also, that's kind of the reason for giving a more general understanding and using those things like the faculties help us understand more fully how to enter into prayer, not necessarily the, the type of prayer, although we looked at Lexio. Um, so I do hope that that's, um, that that's a help for y'all, understanding how we enter into relationship, how we look away from the self and we look towards God, and how that make, brings us to the greatest happiness that we'll ever know. Um, how that brings us into relationship, how that brings us closer to heaven.
So again, next week we are, um, we're not meeting next week, giving y'all a free, a free week there. Um, but as we come into the following week, we're going to be continuing talking about prayer, but talking about, again, um, like I was saying earlier, the liturgical life and what that means and why we want to enter into a prayer that can sometimes feel very stiff and a little bit too structured and maybe like it's not even really prayer because of the structure of it. Uh, but I really encourage y'all in the next two weeks when you're, when you're trying to uh, enter into these um, scriptures, you know, that 20 or 30 minutes a day, whatever you can sacrifice to the Lord, um, that it also helps you to enter into the Mass on Sunday, okay? That it also helps you, if you're a daily Mass goer, to enter into the Mass on weekdays. If you pray the Liturgy of the Hours, to enter more fully into that. Um, and then that day on June 22nd, we'll be talking about, we'll be breaking open a little bit more of the liturgical life. So thank you guys so much for coming. Um, and if, again, if you missed any of the previous classes, they are on our podcast and on our Facebook. And um, we do still have copies of last week's uh, notes hanging out in the back if you wanted any. Um, but let's close in prayer. And... Uh, is free. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you once again for helping us to more deeply understand your heart. Help us every day to enter more deeply into it. Help us to gaze at you with the love that you look upon us with. Holy Spirit, set our hearts on fire to live our Christian life out in the world, to always come back to you for intimate moments of prayer and relationship. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.